I'm born in New York, raised in New Jersey, spent much of my formative years in the United States, uh, was trained as a journalist and later as a geographer. I hold multiple degrees from different universities. And my exposure to Armenia came in 1993 for the first time when I came here as a freelance writer to cover the war in Karabakh. And that was really a transformative experience for me because um, I experienced it rather viscerally. I spent a lot of time at the front lines with those who were doing the fighting and at times the dying. And it, um, I think it affected me in a long lasting way. I became committed to Armenia as a result of that trip. And 23 years later, I still come and go regularly working on various projects with the Tufankin Foundation and otherwise occasionally writing articles for different newspapers. So let's talk about, first of all, how the Tufankin Foundation came into being. It's a very interesting story, and I think it's one that you'll enjoy hearing. Uh, the Tufankin Foundation is the brainchild of James Tufankin, who's an Armenian-American entrepreneur, businessman, who uh, began coming to Armenia in the early mid-90s. Uh, there he is. James is a very interesting story, and I think it's worth uh, spending a few minutes uh, talking about how James came to Armenia, because it's really a fascinating story. Uh, he grew up essentially as an Odav, as a non-Armenian. Uh, his family uh, fled Turkey in the late 1890s, even before the genocide, as a result of the Hamidian massacres of the late 1890s. And they settled in California, first worked in agriculture. Part of his family was in carpet, uh, carpet selling. But the family encountered racism, as many Armenians did in California in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, if you can imagine, the Armenians of those days uh, were the equivalent of the Mexicans today. Migrant laborers, immigrants, poor, often doing menial labor and subject to racist attitudes from older American generations. Well, his family didn't put up with it. They were sick and tired of it. They picked up and moved from California to Oregon. And there was not much of an Armenian community in Oregon. And they decided basically to integrate fully with American society. They changed their name from Tufankin to Francis. They became American. They were already of the Protestant faith, but they joined the American Presbyterian Church and completely shed their Armenian identity. So this fellow grew up as James Francis, dimly aware that somewhere in his past there were Armenian ancestors. But he really did not identify as an Armenian or consider himself Armenian. That actually came much later in the 1970s and 80s when he moved to New York to go to law school. And he went to New York University, and across the street, uh, across the hall in his dorm, was an Armenian fellow who became his buddy. And the Armenian community in New York, as you know, is rather large. And over time, he sort of rediscovered his Armenian identity and became, I would say, a born again Armenian. And in fact, I mean, if the first half of his life was dimly aware of his Armenian identity, he's gone in the other direction, becoming a super army and trying to make up for lost time. So this is by way of background. He made his success manufacturing and designing high-end carpets, uh, manufacturing them in Asia, mostly in Nepal, and selling them in Europe and especially the United States. And he made his success in the 1980s. By the early 1990s, he was one of the leading businessmen in the carpet and home furnishings industry. He had done very well for himself. But like some of us, he also grew tired of helping Armenia by simply writing a check. For those of you who know your modern history, Armenia was a basket case in the late 1980s, early 1990s. If you remember those days, or if you read about those days, we suffered an earthquake, we went through the Karabakh War, the collapse of the Soviet Union left our economy in shambles, in the early 90s, you didn't have light, heat, or running water. Living in Armenia was truly a sacrifice for everyone, even if you had a little bit of money. It was difficult to live in those days day to day. 
So many Armenians in the diaspora helped by providing aid, making donations, sending over warm clothes, uh, finding different ways to help on an emergency basis. And James was one of those. He'd write a check uh, to various charities to help Armenia. But he got tired of that, and he felt that he could do more for Armenia than simply write a check. He said, you know, I have skills as a businessman. I've worked in foreign countries like China and Nepal. I would love to come to Armenia and help grow businesses to create jobs. And this was a particularly visionary idea back in the early 90s, because very few businessmen thought of Armenia as a place to invest in the early 90s. Okay, like I said, Armenia was considered to be a basket case. It was a place to send aid. It was a place to send relief. It was a charity case. But he thought a little bit differently. And in 1993, he began very small, quietly, to establish carpet weaving facilities in the remote border regions of Armenia. And uh, I have the happy experience of bringing over his first loom and trying it, to get it through customs in Moscow. My Russian journalist friend had helped me get it through by claiming that it was a fishing pole and we were going to go fishing. Um, and of course, he had to pay off a few of the Russian, uh, Russian uh, police at customs, but we got the loom in and eventually, through more standard means, got many looms in. And very quietly, gradually, uh, James established carpet weaving facilities. And he took the rugs and would take them to Europe, wash them, and then sell them, often in the United States. Uh, by the late 1990s, his carpet weaving facilities were employing close to 1,000 people, mostly women, who at the time were considered unemployable. Especially in the 1990s, it was very difficult for women to gain gainful employment, especially outside of Yerevan. So, <clears throat> In a sense, he was able to realize his dream, not simply to send over donations, but to actually make a difference on the ground using his skills, using his abilities. Um, and again, it's remarkable to me because the fellow doesn't speak Armenian, even to this day. His Armenian language skills are pretty poor, but he has a knack for working in foreign countries, uh, again, China, Nepal, and elsewhere. So he uh, became intimately aware of how to deal with other cultures and how to understand people in a business sense, even if you couldn't communicate always directly. So I think that was really the first phase, if you will, of James's involvement in Armenia. But by the late 1990s, he started getting restless again and felt that he wanted to make a more direct intervention in the life of the country very happy that he's able to provide many jobs, but he also saw a lot of social problems. Unemployment, uh, the rule of law not always respected, many people in vulnerable conditions. So he felt that in order to make a more direct intervention, he should establish a charitable foundation to do direct work amongst those in need. So the foundation was started in 1998, and when it began, it addressed the needs of those days, the needs of the 1990s. Accordingly, we set up orphanages, social work centers for the very poor and needy, provided Christmas gifts to very poor kids. Generally, it was traditional sorts of aid to needy people, helping them out of the worst conditions and giving them some comfort, giving them some momentary comfort and happiness. But over time, the foundation grew, and by the early mid-2000s, we were engaging in more civil society work. So the foundation began to support projects like the Achilles NGO. Some of you may have heard of Achilles. It defends the rights of pedestrians from bad drivers and defends the rights of drivers from predatory police taking bribes. At that time, 10, 15 years ago, that was a big problem. Still a problem, but maybe not quite as severe. Uh, the Consumer Rights Union got its first grant from the Tufankin Foundation. The Consumer Rights Union struggled to label food products for health and safety. 
10, 15 years ago, most products weren't labeled in the market. You didn't know if a product was safe to eat or not. So the Trefankin Foundation moved from uh, mainstream charitable assistance to more assistance that is helping people help themselves. And our social work projects also took on more of a rehabilitative nature. Uh, the Zankagadun NGO, which later has become the family and community NGO, is designed to help poor, vulnerable people help themselves, giving them legal counseling, psychological counseling, often providing other kinds of support that enable people to get back up on their feet and function in society. One of the outgrowths of that program is, in fact, the Women's Support Center, which uh, we established in 2010 in partnership with uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, and the Armenian International Women's Association, AWA. Together, we created a program based on some of the neediest cases in Zankagodun who were the women. We often dealt with needy, vulnerable families and found that the women were often bearing the brunt of oppression. They were bearing the brunt of the problem. So we established a women's support center that more directly dealt with women's issues, and particularly the issue of domestic violence, which is a severe problem, violence against women, and the oppression of women in society here is a severe problem. And the women's support center has taken the role of both being a service provider, that is helping women in an immediate sense get out of bad situations, but also it plays an advocacy role helping combat gender stereotypes, helping women get back on their feet, providing vocational training, job placement, so women can get back on their feet and reintegrate into society, either returning to their family or more often not returning to their family and standing up on their feet as uh, independent individuals. So again, this is to give you a sense of how to thank them has moved. The foundation also supports various social movements uh, for example, we've helped environmental activists who have fought issues like the uh, <clears throat> illegal mining in the country. Uh, we are a partner now with the AUA, the American University of Armenia, which has a center for responsible mining that is trying to clean up mining practices in the country. And we not only help the AUA, we help activists who campaign against illegal mining. We've supported other environmental women and other activists in trying to develop the citizenship of Armenia to become more active participants in the life of this country. So over time, we've moved from a traditional model of aid to a more innovative model in which we try to engage our recipients as active participants. One other thing is that we try generally not to fund in perpetuity. That is, we will take on a project, grow it over three years, five years, seven years, and eventually work to make that project independent and self-sustaining. For example, before there was TUMO, there were a number of smaller operations, one of which was the Manana NGO, which provided outlets for underprivileged kids to do uh, photojournalism, creative writing, illustrating, and other skills through after-school enrichment programs. Well, we funded Manana for about seven, eight, nine years, and eventually they developed their own abilities to raise funds. They now enter international competitions, they receive international grants from different agencies, and eventually they no longer needed the Tufankin Foundation. That is the best result of our efforts, is that we create a situation where our recipients become self-sufficient and they take off. They take off and they make something of their NGO or their center that we've been supporting. And that way the foundation is able to move on and rotate into new areas of activity. Now, so far I've been talking about Armenia. I'll show you a few slides in a moment. Uh, in 2003, uh, James Tufankin kind of lured me, seduced me into coming back to Armenia and setting up a second office for the foundation in Gharapov, in Artsakh. Uh, the foundation generally has taken the role of playing a leading edge in its activities. What do I mean by leading edge? We generally seek out 
areas where no one is doing any work or the work has no visibility. We try to fill the vacuum, try to fill a void, and take that area of activity and raise it to a level of visibility where other actors, other funders, the government, international agencies will take interest so that there's a critical mass of support behind the projects that we do. So a perfect example of that is in Artsakh. Uh, James asked me to spend six months there in 2003, sort of do some research and get a feel for the lay of the land, and come back to him and offer proposals on what the foundation could be doing. And as you probably know, Artsakh, Rabach, presents many challenges, social, obviously military, political. But among all the various challenges and all of the various things we could be doing, we decided ultimately to focus on one thing. And our main focus there is to work in the border areas of Karabakh, the so-called liberated territories, like for, uh, Kashatav, formerly Lachin, Kalbajar, uh, and other areas that link Artsakh to Armenia, but are claimed by Azerbaijan. Those are claimed by Azerbaijan who call them occupied territories. Very few organizations work in these territories. The World Bank doesn't go there. USAID doesn't go there. No agencies go there because they're contested areas. They're very risky. They're very vulnerable. But in the view of Artsakh's government, if we don't resettle those areas, which connect Karabakh to Armenia and make them one, those areas are ever more likely to be overrun or to be given back. And as you know, and we'll show you the map in a moment, without, for example, without watching, Artsakh becomes an island that can be encircled on all sides by Azeri forces. So when we saw that practically no one was doing any work in these areas, and there's a great need for resettling these areas in order to fortify them, we decided to focus most of our work in that area. Uh, and I would like to think that we have popularized that work. Now we're not the only ones. There are other large nonprofits, NGOs, uh, certainly not international organizations because they stay away from those areas. But in the Armenian world, more organizations now actually deal with the Kashatav region and some of the other liberated territories. Um, the Artsakh Fund of Lebanon, which has established the RE business program. Friends of Armenia, based in Los Angeles. Even the Armenia Fund now has devoted different, Hayastan Himnatram has devoted some of its projects to the Kashatal area. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, there are other small budding organizations like Haida Nasev that are now building schools, houses, and other. Um, uh, other infrastructure also in that area. So <clears throat> this is sort of our model, is we try to take ideas, issues, activity areas that are off the radar screen, that are essentially vacuous, and fill the vacuum with our activity and raise those activities to a level of visibility. So we'll talk a little bit as I show you some slides, but um, this is, in a nutshell, the work that we do. Yeah, so one of our projects, this is in conjunction with the AMAA, the Armenian Missionary Association, is the Shov Daycare Centers. There is one in uh, Vanatur, there's one in Yerevan, and a newly opened one in Shushi, in Artsakh, that deals with children from particularly vulnerable families who uh, need help in terms of after-school enrichment programs, in terms of additional tutoring, and often, especially in the neediest cases, they need counseling, uh, often psychological counseling, because they may come from dysfunctional families. So this is actually one of our more successful programs, uh, and is generally an after-school program. The Women's Support Center, which began as a Tufankia project jointly with our partners, has now spun off and has become an NGO unto itself. The Women's Support Center, as I mentioned earlier, does two important things. One is it is a service provider to women who are subject to abuse or domestic violence. But it's not only a service provider, it's also an advocacy group. 
working to develop legislation on domestic violence, and that gender stereotypes in society, producing public service announcements on the role of women in society. So I'm very happy to say after uh, four years, from 2010 to 14, the Women's Support Center applied and received its own NGO status and is now self-funded with help from Jafankin, but other partners and other funders as well. Moving on. Okay, in Karabakh. Okay, I was talking to you about the liberated territories. Let's be more specific. Okay, here's a map of the region. You see Armenia. You see the bordering countries, Georgia to the north, Turkey to the west, Iran to the south, Azerbaijan to the east, and of course Russia looming above it all. And to the east of Armenia is Karabakh. Now, Karabakh here is the white territory, and very quickly, the kidney-shaped smaller territory here is the old NKAO, the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblast. This territory was carved away from Armenia by decision of Stalin in 1923 and awarded to Azerbaijan, but with a special status guaranteeing the Armenians autonomy. The larger white territory here, 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 those are the liberated territories. When Armenians drove Azerbaijani forces out of Karabakh in 1994, they didn't simply stop at the old NKAO borders, they moved beyond them. Some of these territories, for example, here in the south, have great strategic importance because they extend our border with Iran by over 100 kilometers. That means that they push Azerbaijani forces, military forces, 100 kilometers further away from our population. Very important. Probably most important strategically are these territories here, which create an integrated unity between Armenia and Karabakh. Before, the old NKO, you can see, was like an island. It was an enclave surrounded on all sides by Azerbaijan. The other thing I should mention is that many of these liberated territories, especially Kashatal and Kelbaja, if you go there, it's a wonderland of Armenian artifacts, historic Armenian churches, cemeteries, sometimes entire villages that go back centuries, really attest to the Armenian pedigree, the Armenian provenance of those areas. Until 1920, these were largely Armenian populated areas. They became non-Armenian populated areas due to ethnic cleansing, due to genocide. But if you go to these areas to this day, some of the most uh, amazing historic artifacts, the Tadeivank Monastery, Zidzernavank Monastery, they go back to the days of Krikor Busavorich, back to the fourth century. These are testaments to the fact that these lands are Armenian lands. So this is just to give you a picture of the work we do. And these numbers indicate different places where we have projects. What sorts of projects? Well, we generally try to foster resettlement. We build houses for those who wish to live there. Uh, we repair houses for many people who do not have decent housing. We build health clinics and other health care facilities. And more recently, we've begun small business activities. Most recently, we established a beeswax facility uh, that manufactures beeswax for the people who have honeycombs, people who grow honey in Kashatal and Kelpaja. Uh, we operate greenhouses, pomegranate orchards, and other small projects that help create jobs and help gradually develop the economy of that area. If we're ever going to hold on to those lands, we need an economy. People need jobs. They need places where they can sell their goods. And so gradually, we're moving away from simply building houses which is important to the second phase, which is job creation activity in these areas. Yes? Question. To repopulate those areas with Armenians, is land housing being given to them or being sold to them? Yes, the, the Karabakh government offers generous subsidies to anyone who wishes to move there. They provide free land per family member. Uh, they provide free housing for those who choose to live on condition that you live continuously for 10 years. 
they don't just hand you the house. You've got to live there and demonstrate a commitment, and then they'll give you the house after 10 years. Um, Health care is heavily subsidized, and there are other subsidies. I believe you get a small amount of livestock free per family member. So <clears throat> it does create incentives, but largely for people who are less fortunate. Most of the people who live in these areas are, in fact, refugees. There's a small number of people who moved from Karabakh or who came from Armenia during the war and stayed. But many of the others are from the earthquake zone, who lived in misery in uh, Gumri or Vanazor, and they moved there. Others are refugees from Baku, Sungai, or other places in Azerbaijan. Okay. More recently, we've begun resettling Armenians from the Middle East, from Iraq and Syria, who are agriculturalists and looking for a place to live in Armenia. So let's look at some of the slides. So this is just sort of a summary introduction of our work. Since 2003, we've pursued resettlement activities in Artsakh, focusing on the borderlands and especially the liberated territory. Among these territories, we've focused especially on Kashata, which connects Artsakh to Armenia and is therefore strategically vital in our various efforts, housing, infrastructure, healthcare, agriculture, small business development, are all geared toward resettling and developing these areas so they become better integrated into Karabakh's polity, economy, and society. Within Kashatal, our efforts have tended toward the southern regions, which are more densely populated and possess a favorable environment for agriculture. Okay. For those of you who know your history, much of the Kashatal region was known for orchards and vineyards during the Soviet era. Unfortunately, much of the region's infrastructure was uprooted due to the gravities of the war. Housing, electricity, drinking water, roads, medical facilities were all severely lacking in 1995 when resettlement began. Since then, the NKR authorities, Karabakh's authorities, with help from private donors, have managed to improve many basic conditions, but housing remains a serious issue. Here are some facts. The size of the region, the population, 10,000, maybe closer to 11 now. Armenian territory until 1921, liberated in 1994. Strategically important region for the defense of Armenia and Artsakh. And Artsakh's president, Bako Sahakyan, repeatedly says that Karabakh exists as long as Kashatav exists. So, here's a fellow on the lower right, Shiragun Abedian, who uh, came to Kashatab in 2011 from the village of Kamishli in northeastern Syria. Um, he's an agriculturalist. Um, I wouldn't call him a refugee. He actually came before the Syrian civil war. He actually was a fairly successful agriculturalist and saw that there was plenty of room to develop agriculture. So he moved with his extended family to Kashatab and they cultivate grain, mostly wheat, and have done quite well. Picture of Syrian Armenians cultivating the land. An interview with Mr. Don Abedian. Next slide. Uh, here are some buildings that we renovated together with the NKR government. Here's a, a 12 apartment building. You can go on. This is a before and after shot. Here's the before. Most of the buildings in Kashata are semi-ruined. They're often severely defaced, but if the foundation is okay, we can work to renovate those buildings. So that's before and here's after. A nice renovation job and then handing over the keys to one of the resettlers from Syria on the upper right. One of our other big projects is the Arachamuf village, which is found in the southernmost region of Gharapa, Hadrut, formerly in what was called Jabrayu. Arachamu is a village that we built from scratch. Today there are um, 18 houses, a population of close to 90. The village has a school, it has a pomegranate orchard, uh, it has uh, a town hall, and we hope soon we'll also have a clinic. And it also has a nearby military base, which employs a number of people, and there are uh, current and retired officers, as well as others who live in this village. 
This is another shot of the village. In the center, it's an aerial shot of the houses. In the upper right are small pomegranate trees that hopefully this year will bring us a nice harvest. Uh, library in the school that we built together with a partner organization in LA, the Armenian Educational Foundation. Uh, a scene again of pomegranate orchards in the lower left and kids in the school on the lower right. There's a scene from the school and the pomegranate orchards. And in the lower right is a house with a small garden in the front. Okay, so that's, that's to just to give you a flavor of some of the work that we do. I think I've spoken more than long enough. So why don't I stop, ask Rafi to say a few words about some of our current projects, and then we'll take your questions. Serious problems when it comes to uh, you know their 
uh, economic and social development. So what we're doing is we're working to support these soldiers by renovating their houses, by ensuring that their mobility problem is solved in their houses, they can move around, and also trying to support uh, through other activities their livelihoods. So those of you who can say that they can come and tell the stories of the soldiers who gave their lives or, or were wounded because they were defending the historic lands. If you can tell their stories to the uh, public in Armenia and to the Armenians abroad, the diaspora Armenians, you will be doing a great job because people in Armenia and outside of our Armenia will realize that some of those young men and women are giving their lives and the least we can do is support them by providing them help, giving them a house or uh, establishing a business there and uh, or supporting their children. So telling the stories of the Artsakh people is also very important. And here, uh, if we have journalists, if we have writers, if we have those who are experts in PR, they can do a great job. They can come and see how these people live and tell uh, uh, to the Armenians all over the world the real heroic, the real heroic lives of these uh, villagers in Nagorno-Karabakh. In Armenia, we work again in Vanatsu, in Yerevan, and in Mezan with children. I spoke, I spoke about the, the social work, the need for social work. So you can get involved there also. Work with the families. Work with another, another thing that I want to uh, mention here. A lot of the social workers in Armenia and the educators, they come from the Soviet era. Their way of education, it's not that it's bad, but it's kind of obsolete. They need to upgrade and update their knowledge. They need to learn new stuff. They need to learn new methodologies. And you guys can do a great job here by bringing new knowledge, new techniques, new uh, ways of intervention with the lives of the, with the education system, with the social work system. And uh, the psychologists and the social workers here, I'm sure they will be able to help us there as well. In Nagorno Karabakh, we also are now trying to establish new businesses. We don't want to give them homes, as Antran said, and say goodbye. We want to see their livelihoods improving. We want to see that the economies are growing. What we did in the uh, uh, a few months ago was open a beeswax factory. You know, honey making and honey is a big business now in that region. And those guys had to drive all the way to Yerevan to come and buy the beeswax where the bees actually make the honey in Yerevan and uh, go back there and put it in the hives. Now we have established a factory there and the people do not need to drive four hours to buy an 8,000, uh, uh, 6,000 gram or uh, 10,000 gram worth, worth of stuff and go back there spend half, uh, as much money on gas and petrol. So they can do it by buying the, the material they need from the shop that would the factory that we have established. And uh, we are thinking of opening, for example, the bakery there. There is no bakery in, Ber in the Berzor area. And the, the bread comes from uh, it's almost an hour and a half drive. So if we have a bakery there, people will work, they will sell bread, and everybody will be able to, you know, come and buy and, and trade, and, and life will start, you know, uh, uh, anew for a family that will run that business. <coughs> we, during the war, and uh, we also provided help to the army by bringing some medical uh, Stuff. Have you heard of sea locks? I haven't heard of that also. When the soldiers are wounded and when there is heavy bleeding, sea uh, locks is a material that helps stop bleeding 
uh, until the soldier is rushed to the hospital or forward to the first thing. Maro actually was at the most dangerous uh, posts on the front line distributing uh, the material to the uh, people there, to the soldiers there, the medical uh, staff of the army. And uh, if you think that you can volunteer with the army, with the uh, hospital, with the medical clinics, not necessarily involved with Tufankian directly, again, we can help you come and do something there because what we think is when you're helping Artsakh, you're doing the job that we want you to do, regardless if you're involved directly with Tufankian or indirectly with Tufankian. We need also, we want to develop the Kashata region. We know that it's an agriculture can be great business there, but we want to do new stuff. We want to see what kind of new products we can have in that area. Specifically in the south, we want to see if we can bring new fruits. Someone said, you know, persimmons might be a great idea there. Someone else said, there are no blueberries in Armenia. Why don't we try blueberries? But it's not only making uh, wishes, or th this needs serious uh, research. Someone who understands agriculture has to go there and do uh, some research, see whether the weather allows it, whether you, the soil is good for it, whether you know, the uh, climate is perfect for something new. And if it is, then we can try it, we can do pilot projects. So those who understand the agriculture and introduction of new foods, they can come and help us there. Antony said we have renovated schools there. If someone wants to come and teach English to the kids in the village, teach them how to use the computer and teach them how to connect with the rest of the world, with the rest of the Armenian world there. That's something that we also uh, appreciate a lot. There are limitless opportunities. Some of you said we do marketing. You know, one of the problems we have, not only in uh, Armenia, but specifically in, in Artsakh and in those areas, that people know how to produce stuff, but they don't, do not know how to sell it. They don't, do not know how to market it. They do not know how to package it. If someone comes and does a research and needs study and how we can meet the, the, the challenges there of marketing, of packaging, of understanding uh, the, the, uh, the way that the products are sent to Yerevan, to, to probably to Iran or somewhere else, that's also a, a great help that we can get. And we can teach it to the rest of the uh, people in, in that area. So there are limitless opportunities. As they say, the sky is the limit. There are many things we can do. Right now, one of your friends, her name is, she used to work with Het as a reporter. Het. 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 Yeah, Catherine. She is now working in Stepana. Uh, with the Halo Foundation. Halo does a great job by demining the areas where after the war uh, mines were left and, and it was covered with uh, trees and bushes and, and, and people can get killed. And actually people were dying usually. Now she's working with the Halo uh, Foundation. She also we also come contact with her and she's going to write stories about our work in, in, uh, uh, in that particular part of Armenia. And we, will, we appreciate that a lot because our stories, I believe, are the most interesting stories that people can hear. If you, I'm going to tell you a final story and sum it up and then we will get uh, questions from you. When we were trying to uh, find soldiers who were he heavily wounded 
and we thought they need our help. At least the least we can do is support them by renovating their houses. We got a list of some soldiers from the Ministry of Social Affairs of uh, Artsakh. So we were visiting some, we shortlisted it, and we were going to the Go village. And Go village is in the hut area. We drove there and we drove up the hill, really bad roads. I actually had some pain in my back and I was thinking, how did this guy who was wounded and was partially handicapped was, you know, transported from this area and went back and forth to Yerevan and to Stepanakir and to go. We reached a very old home, probably centuries old, crumbling, and uh, we knocked the door and uh, nobody came out. And then we walked in and we saw this 50-year-old man. He has been in the Nagorno Karabakh army for more than 15 years in the special forces. His name is Bachi. And he's been in so many wars, so many operations, and he's in the reconnaissance and special operations unit. And during the April War, while doing his duty, the bomb exploded next to him. And the piece of the bomb, shrapnel, penetrated his body, scratched the outer bones of uh, his spinal cord, and then passed through the lungs and went out, leaving him, you know, uh, almost dying in his post. His friends saved him, and he was treated in Stepanaget and Yerevan for a month and a half. He was a very simple man, very open, very warm. He greeted us as if we knew him from like past centuries. And we were like having fun discussing, he had problems moving around because his lungs were not uh, recovered yet and his spinal cord needed long-term therapy. And uh, he said, my younger son is 19 years old and he was recruited to the army because it's mandatory serving in the army. My older son is 26 years old and he is a contract soldier in the army. My wife works in the kindergarten and I am also a special forces unit member in the army. The three of us were fighting on the front. Luckily, nothing happened to my sons. I was the only one who was injured. And thanks a lot, thanks to God, I, know, I, know, I didn't die. And uh, I asked him, you know, what, what do you think about this war? Why, what, what do you think about what happened? What do you think about the future of, of this country? He said, I've been living here for, my family's been living here for centuries. I don't even remember when they came to this part of this, of, uh, of uh, Artsakh. This is my land. I have no choice but to defend it with my sons and with my wife and probably even my tornies, my grandsons and my grandchildren will join me one day in defending this land. These people are giving their lives. And it's a noble thing they're doing. The least we can do, the least we can do is help them have a decent life on their homeland. And uh, you guys can join us and we can do a great job. Not necessarily by going to the front line and fighting, but by providing support to the children, to the women, to the ladies, to the old uh, people there. And that would be a great job that we can do. Thank you.